working. Let me know when you push record. When I press record or after I press record? Like when we start, so we can start schmoozing about space We're, and stuff. We have started. We are schmoozing. We are space. Oh, hello. We started? Hey, hello. the lines yes. are wiggling because we started. Hello. <laughs> hello, friends. Welcome to Science Actually Presents The Nerd and the Scientist, your favorite podcast about, no, you know, not about anything. In general, speak your favorite podcast. Your favorite podcast. If this is not your favorite podcast, then what are you even doing? Like, what what could possibly compete with what we (laughs) have going on over here? This isn't your favorite podcast. That means you listen to more (laughs) than one podcast. (laughs) I wonder, (laughs) like, are there people out there who only listen to one podcast? It's like once, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound, right? (laughs) This becomes your whole personality. (laughs) I listen to a gaggle of podcasts. Actually, no, I don't. I, I have a gaggle of them bookmarked. I listen to four. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like podcasts for me are like books. I just have a stack of books on my bedside table that I'm going to read, and I will still buy new books to read. Yeah, so me too. Like... I also have a stack of books that I read from words with <laughs> fonts and Page, pages, <laughs> paper. So, so yeah, for our listeners, uh, as you can probably tell, this is going to be a very intelligent conversation today. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was talking we, with Kavi the other day, because we talk when we're not recording this wonderful show, and I <laughs> asked him a question. I said, Kavi, and he said, yes, Benjamin, you poor fool. And I said, hey, Kavi. I call him Cobbs, which I just made that up just now. What's up, Cobbs? Hey, I said, hey, Cobby. I said, <laughs> you know, I have a question, bro. And he's like, what up, bro? He says, he calls me bro. I call him Cobbs. He calls me bro. That's how we do things because we're from the streets. <laughs> and I said, hey, Cobby, <clears throat> I had a question. And that's actually a science question. And he was like, this is a good idea for the show. I said, Cobby. I says to him, I said, Cobbs. He said, what's up, Cobby? I says, Cobby. I said, I says to him, says, Kavi, Kavi, I says, I said, Kavi, you know how stars burn that hydrogen stuff and they burn it in to convert it into helium, right? They do that for most of their lives. And then after they're done with that, they start making helium into what's next? The next one, lithium sometimes. And they have, and they do that for a less amount of time. And then as the elements get heavier and heavier, the fuel that they're using lasts for less and less amount of time until there's a big explosion Rooney at the end when the star dies. And that's when it makes the heaviest elements. So I asked Kavi, I said, so what percent of a star's life uh, is, and I assume it's a very small fraction of a percent, is goes into actually making, you know, gold or goes into making uranium that kind of stuff and i thought Kavi could shed some light and i had follow-up questions which i have by the way that was a great intro from me that was exactly (laughs) your turn Kavi. you need to do the intro every time from now on because i love how perfectly how perfectly you recreated the conversation that happened right over two lines in Facebook Messenger and now became a... <laughs> so anyway, I says to my cousin Ira, I says... And I, and I tell so I says I to says, Mabel, hey. I says, you gotta bring the cows out of the barn, Mabel. You gotta bring the cows out of the barn. Ah, Mabel. Uh, that bitch. Hey, moving along. Let's talk about stars. Uh, stars, <laughs> yes. So, Space. <laughs> Space, the final frontier of knowledge. Um, these are the voyages of chemical abundances in stars. And it, like honestly, it's a really good question. And I feel like every single time Benjamin's like, oh, hey, hey, Cubs, got a question, question for you, Cubs. <laughs> every time he's like, oh, well, shucks. I mean, I, I don't know if this is a smart question. But I'm just a simple man, but uh, maybe. And then he goes on to ask like a really valid question that is like an active area of research or things that like we're still working on and trying to figure out. So 
Yes, all good questions. All good questions. Um, so, so here's the thing, right? Stars, as I, I probably mentioned in a previous episode, or anybody who's ever had the misfortune of spending too much time around me has heard my explanation of like how a star lives, right? Mm -hmm. The star forms from a cloud of hydrogen gas in space, a nebula, um, and gravity pulls everything in. It gets dense enough to start fusing the hydrogen into helium. And it does that for a long damn time. Like right. depending on how much mass there was in that clump of hydrogen to begin with, um, you're talking of like tens of millions of years or, or hundreds, or in some cases, like billions of years, right? Like our sun will be um, on what's called the main sequence of stars, um, you know, burning hydrogen for billions of years, right? Four billion, um, right? Yeah, it's like we've been doing it for four billion. We've got another four billion left. Oh, we're halfway there. Um, don't finish that lyric or we might get sued because we don't have the rights to that song. But um, yeah, so so like that's the majority. <laughs> Thank you for getting that. Um, the pity laugh was great. But but yeah, that's like... No, that's like means... <laughs> catching up slowly. It's a good joke. It just took me a while to get there. It's fine. It's, uh, we're recording this in the afternoon Sydney time, which means it's the middle of the night in the US of A um, because the earth is not flat and there are time zones. So, that is a beautiful uh, thing about our show. <laughs> you have a, we are a, a, a dual hemisphere show. <laughs> One of us will always be exhausted. Any well. recording. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so, um, so, so basically uh, when, when the hydrogen is burnt and into, you know, fusing into helium, um, there are kind of like a bunch of products that are made, um, but eventually uh, there are kind of some main products that are made in each of these stages um, and it gets heavier and heavier elements. So normally there's a process called hydrogen burning, as I mentioned, burns into helium. The process after that is triple alpha, uh, where you know, you're burning helium into carbon and oxygen. Then you, you burn the carbon and then you create neon and, and sodium and uh, you know, other elements. And then you burn the neon into oxygen, you burn the oxygen into silicon and argon and calcium. And then the silicon burns into nickel and then it kind of has to stop there because um, if you remember that diagram that I sent you in response, uh, you're know, like, oh, what's that little? Yeah. So, so like there's basically this whole process is, you know, whole process is, you know, fusing things at the center as things collapse inwards under gravity. And that fusion creates a force that pushes outwards. And like that is stable because there's kind of a balance between, you know, the energy consumed in the process and the energy produced by the process. But after nickel, it takes more energy to do the fusion than the fusion produces. Okay. Um, roughly speaking. And so basically when a, a star, a, a, like a massive star, that's like, let's say at least eight times as massive as our sun, um, when it gets to that point, it it eventually the core just collapses and it becomes this beautiful supernova uh, because it cannot you can't directly create heavier elements than iron um, through that nuclear stellar fusion process. Um, I can tell you about the times, but I I'm not sure. Did you did you have a question? Was that uh, and we lost well, on the weed? You can keep keep talking about the times, but I did have a question about two articles that I have read basically saying the same thing that the bulk of the heavier elements uh, don't just come from uh, a star uh, exhausting its fuel and therefore burning heavier and heavier and heavier leftovers from its regular natural process, but instead uh, from the collisions of neutron stars. Hmm. These incredibly dense things, which are already under incredible, incredible temperature and stresses, unlike what our regular sun, our sun has. And when they Who are you calling dense? 
I'm calling myself very dense. I can't pick up social cues at all. I am just like this thing at a party, and I'm like, I don't get it. Where's the dip? Anyway, uh, me, I'm the dip. Anyway, moving along. <laughs> Neutron stars, really, really dense, really, really hot things, and when they collide, because they are so uniquely different from our sun, or stars like our sun, and when these two things collide, that's the explosion. That's the environment that's created that generates really heavy stuff is mm. that does that hold that hydrogen monoxide so so okay yeah see, so see so water Let's see how i said ah uh, that's smart i said fancy it's bits. the chemicals yeah as a physicist I, I shouldn't i shouldn't talk about chemicals but chemistry is just like physics if if you have really bad resolution um so <laughs> <laughs> oh my god All right. <laughs> but no, you're 100 percent right right so like all those processes that i mentioned before it's like you know burning hydrogen <laughs> are you okay i'm yes, just happy i'm right. getting things right copy went to school that's to learn right. all this stuff i just you know i'm in california that's it and i yeah, get the same out, i got the same no ones you got you got all the no ones <laughs> but yeah you got hydrogen burning for you know tens of billions tens of millions of years um you know, you got like a million years of burning helium and then like a thousand years of burning carbon and then like a couple of years of burning neon and then a few months of burning oxygen. And then like the, the like that last stage of burning silicon into into nickel, which then decays mm -hmm. into iron. Like you're talking about days. Really? So, yeah. It's, it's pretty wild because like everything in space generally, especially for like star related things, generally you know it doesn't happen on the time scale of our lifetime so um, when a star is creating iron that's literally it that's that's it's it. like the last days of its life it's, and then it's literally it's, the last gasp when people say that kind of stuff it's on a stellar yeah. scale that's quite literally it wow i didn't yeah. know it was just a couple of days that's awesome it's wild but yeah the, the thing that you're raising about neutron stars and stuff um so like yeah the, to, to get to get you know, you can get up to iron and, and that's it with like standard nuclear burning in a star. But stars that are more massive than the sun, but like, you know, up to a certain point will explode as a supernova. Um, once, you, once you get like too massive, you don't see a supernova because the leftover core, like the heart of the star just collapses into a black hole. Mm. Um, because there's just like, there's so much material that doesn't get exploded out in the explosion, right? Because it's basically, it's, it's an implosion, right? Right. The iron can't be burnt stably to push up against the gravitational forces. Um, and so what's happening in a supernova is like everything's collapsing down. There's this huge um, kind of explosion of a neutrinos um, and the neutrinos end up pushing like, uh, or helping to push this like really energetic shock wave out that explodes as you know a bright supernova in fact like 99 percent of the energy from a supernova goes into producing the neutrinos like one percent into the shock wave and like 0.01 percent that produces the, the the emission that myself and other astronomers study but um, you can have the supernova that you can see or you can have the supernova that you don't see because it collapses directly to a black hole but then it's like a middle ground that that leftover core that dense like middle bit that wasn't exploded uh will form a neutron star right so it's it's a neutron rich material that's so dense and it's no longer held up by nuclear fusion uh you know supporting the star against gravitational collapse but it's held up by i know i know i shouldn't say this quantum forces Ooh. i need to look up some kind of a sound effect to overlay on that one <laughs> yeah basically there's this thing in quantum mechanics where um it's called the Pauli exclusion principle uh, two particles uh that have the same energy level and have the same spin can't be in the same place at the same time and so that basically means that if you have those two particles and they want to want to sit in the same place they can't and so they repel each other 
So that repulsion is called quantum pressure or quantum degeneracy pressure. Um, and that, in a neutron star, that is the thing that's pressing back, preventing the star from totally collapsing in a black hole. Okay. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. And so those neutron stars, when they interact with each other, when you have two neutron stars that merge, you have all this neutron rich material. And that's what ends up, you know, uh, producing these heavier neutron rich material. So whether it's, you know, uh, gold or, or uranium, you know, basically some stuff is made by exploding stars. Uh, some stuff is made by um, merging neutron stars. And like, there are a bunch of other things that I'm not really you know, going into the, the detail of, but what's really cool is that we've theoretically known about this, that like, you know, about half of the periodic elements uh, have to be formed by these two neutron stars hitting each other. Right. Um, like we, we've known about that theoretically for, we, we've known about that theoretically for, you know, 30 or 40 years, but it was only in the last decade that we actually saw evidence of that and proof. Wow. Yeah. So platinum comes from neutron stars. Platinum, I believe so. Yes. Yeah. All the neutron rich stuff. Uh -huh. Interesting. Yeah. The more so, you know. so why is it that the rock on my wife's wedding ring costs way more because it's very abundant coal than <laughs> than platinum, which is the result of finding a neutron star, finding another neutron star, <laughs> slapping them together, <laughs> as opposed to the rock on my wife's finger in the middle of the platinum, which is just a bunch of leftover debris from fallen trees from I mean, it's 300 a million years ago. Uh, uh, that's not fair. Uh, I'm that's sorry. Not fair. Yeah. Lisa, by the way, Lisa, if you're listening, uh, <laughs> your ring came from a neutron star. Isn't that nice? The cheap part of it, which is the weirdest part. <laughs> is this time for a break so before we, for a commercial break and then we come back? Yeah, we, commercial break time and then we can come back. Um, Let's make up a commercial. Yes, we'll be right back after our made up commercial. Okay, let's make a commercial. Hey, people out there in the world, do you have a problem that needs solving and you wish you had a product that could solve that problem? Well, I hey, suggest hey. you buy this product to solve that problem for forty nine ninety nine or two monthly installments of twenty four ninety nine nine. You can have product A to solve problem B, and your life will be a breeze. Just wait, are call you us telling at me this I number. <laughs> these are getting, I'm not sure if these are getting worse or better. I'm laughing more. <laughs> Hold on a second. I should have had this ready. I, I, I have a phone number you can call to solve this problem. Just uh, please call for product at area code 248-434-5508. Once again, the phone number you need to call for this amazing product to solve all your problems is area code 248-434-5508. Be sure to tell them Kavi and Benjamin sent you. <laughs> Do I... Do I want to know what that number leads to? Yes, you do. <laughs> Tell me, Benjamin, what does that number lead to? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 434-5508 is a real phone number. Please call it. Uh, long distance phone rates might apply. Oh, wow. Amazing. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. Okay. Well, uh, for any folks listening to this, that's an example of the fine advertising acumen that you could have the chance to uh, utilize if you would like to advertise your product here. Because otherwise, we'll just advertise whatever the automated advertising uh, is that we get given when we sign up to do right. like random networking advertising. Right. Our uh, advertising rates on our show, by the way, is five thousand dollars per commercial? We are willing to negotiate. <laughs> Rates are negotiable. We are very willing to negotiate. Yes. If you'd like to have a advertising on our show, you have to fly Kavi and I on our spouses' first class to Nice, France. 
and then you got it. <laughs> we'll advertise whatever you want. Animal husbandry, you name it. <laughs> so get us to France, please. Sure. Animal husbandry, <laughs> animal whiffery, anything. <laughs> We've advertised <laughs> duck. We'd advertised quantum playing cards, and now no more rubber ducks. No more rubber ducks. We are no. now only advertising phone numbers for mysterious places that I don't know. So there you go. Oh, be quick. Uh, and back to the show. Back to where heavy elements come from. Kavi, where do they come from? Uh, well, to answer that question, I have to answer another question, which is, what is an element? Elements are the uh, various different kinds of atoms that exist in the universe that comprise of all matter. So there the you smallest go. one is hydrogen. Uh, what one proton, one uh, electron, or one neutron, and then as you add more protons and neutrons to the nucleus, the center of the atom. Uh, it grows bigger and bigger and forms the next heavier element. There you and go. only two of yep. them are liquid at room temperature, mercury and bromide. You're welcome. Nice. Thank you. Thank we you. have finally answered the question, the age-old question of what's the matter? Now we know. <laughs> what's the matter? I, I still think it's it wild. Too. I still think it's so wild that like you have this energetic shock wave that's like one of the most powerful things that we that we see you know, causing this incredible explosion right and the shock wave that's produced by this explosion of, of a supernova can be like significant fractions of the speed of light you know like tens of thousands of kilometers per second as this shock wave just kind of goes and like ripples out into space smashing up against any material that's around and that is less than 1% of the overall energy of the supernova. That's crazy, right? It is crazy. Wild, 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 wild. Um, I will say that what's uh, like that, the whole timeline that I gave before um, is, you know, a specific case of like a, you know, 25 ish um, solar mass star. So, Generally speaking, the more massive a star, the faster it burns through its nuclear fuel or its you know, hydrogen mm -hmm. um, and leading to the expression, live fast, die young, massive stars do it well. Um, that is uh, something I can uh, attribute to Kirsten Banks, otherwise known as Astro Kirsten. Um, but it's a good way to remember that more massive stars um, have shorter lives, which is sad, but, you know, they make the best of it. Here's a question for you. When a star finally does explode and it's done, for those stars yep. that do explode when they're done, the timeline of the explosion itself, mm -hmm. say you have a star like our sun. You have a star 50 times our, the mass of our sun. You have a star 100 times the mass of our sun. Um, the bigger they are, as we just explained, thank you, Kavi, the faster they burn out of fuel and the sooner they explode. But they all explode. And is is there some sort of a, uh, 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 I don't know, a trend where the more massive the star, literally the bigger and the more material it has, takes longer to explode to get all that ejecta out? I mean, the, the explosion... Oh, I got him. The, the explosion... Oh, I got him. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Um, <laughs> the explosion itself happens ridiculously fast, like absurdly fast. Also, um, like like the the collapse, right? Like once, mm -hmm. as I as I mentioned, by the way, like um, I don't want people to be like you know running away from this conversation, thinking, "Oh my God, the sun's gonna explode. We're doomed. We're all gonna die." <laughs> we're not well we will we will, well, we will but not because of the uh, except for the vampires um but yeah like the the <laughs> that was the sound of benjamin loading his shotgun um for the vampires was... of course yeah. 
Um, no, so so it to do this thing, like what's considered a massive star that will end in a supernova, it is for about like eight times the mass of the sun and above. So stars that are less massive than eight times the mass of the sun, for example, our sun, <laughs> which has one times the mass of our sun, um, is not... <laughs> Is so it's not going to explode as a supernova. So we don't, uh, or, or like a core collapse supernova. So that's not going to happen. But but yeah, like the the core collapse for those more massive stars happens at like ten to thirty ish percent of the speed of light. Like the whole thing just kind of goes whoop and collapses and implodes inwards. And the explosion also generally happens at these enormous speeds. But the thing the thing that ends up determining how long like the overall supernova will last um like characteristically supernova explodes and like you know we detect it with an optical telescope or something like that and we'll see that last for a couple of weeks the kind of like you know increase in brightness because when a supernova explodes it will be as bright as its host galaxy or even brighter like it can outshine its galaxy um but then you start seeing it at other wavelengths so like you know i work with radio telescopes we only see the explosion from when that shock wave starts hitting the material around it so that will be also like it will start a few weeks after the explosion but it will depend on like the the rate at which the star was losing and like shedding or burping off material prior to the explosion because you know stars just basically throw these wild tantrums as they're getting ready to explode um and like like losing mass out uh, into its surrounding area and so if you can imagine it's like giving off all this matter like you know shells of gas that now float around the star as that shock wave starts propagating out through space it's kind of like going to be bashing up against those clumps of material producing right. of radio light i don't know if that answered your question i don't even remember what my question was anymore but i like listening to you talk <laughs> and he was saying shedding everyone shedding he's shedding. australian shedding s-h-e-d-d-i-n-g yeah. um that yeah saying the naughty <laughs> <laughs> but yeah uh supernova be crazy um i will say for those <laughs> Supernovas be crazy. Quasi, quasi. Like shirt. Collapse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so so with the with the lower mass stars, since I feel like this has accidentally turned into a supernova episode, um, the the lower mass stars like our sun, what will happen is um, that eventually it just kind of dies slowly and quietly like it um it'll turn into a white dwarf and the outer layers will expand um well basically the sun is going to go through a red giant phase which will mean that the outer layer of the sun this hydrogen layer will like puff up and kind of extend out to the radius of like jupiter so the whole that far yeah i think i knew it was going to gobble up the inner planets but i didn't know it was going to go all the way out to jupiter that's a ways Pretty sure it'll end up somewhere around the asteroid belt, maybe Jupiter-ish or Mars-ish. But like, I know that now is the time to invest in property on the moons of Saturn. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, they did just find some carbon uh, coming up from the subsurface oceans of Europa, so they think, thanks to James Webb. So maybe kami has got something. There's probably some good fishing. <laughs> Yeah, the fish that, that are raised on methane, methane fish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're fish that you chuck them on the grill and then they spontaneously combust. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, those are supernovae. Um, did we have any other questions or should we should we start wrapping this episode up? Let's start wrapping it up. I have no idea where we went off the rails or even if we did go off the rails, but we were talking about space the entire time. So we are on topic and that's okay for me. It's fine with me. I get to listen to the sound of my own voice talking about the one topic that I know a little bit about. (laughs) That's it. I'm going to ask you about Broadway musicals next time. Let's see what happens. I'll make them laugh. Make them laugh. Okay, maybe I won't. 
<laughs> oh god um uh, i was gonna make a comment about everybody's uh least favorite uh harvard astronomer um who recently decided to uh organize a broadway or, or an off-broadway musical about his experience trying to hunt for aliens but let's leave that for another episode i don't i don't feel like now is the time or place to go into a rant about that yeah well i won't tell you where that phone number takes you so you don't have to tell me who that astronomer is we're yeah. even <laughs> even steven okay great well ladies and gentlemen and all of you fine non-binary folks out there thank you very, very much for tuning in to this week's episode of Science Actually Presents, The Nerd and the Scientist. That Thank is you guys for listening. Day. It has been our pleasure to bring what we just said to you. I hope <laughs> you enjoyed the words we made and learned things. Thank you. Crap! Now they're going to know that we replaced Benjamin with ChatGPT for this. Uh, oh my <laughs> god! <laughs> I was trying to. I, my mouth was just going with making the words, and I was trying to think of something funny I could just say, and it was just keep going, Benjamin. Don't you're, you're making dead air. Just say words. Say words. So hey, word. just kept going. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just. Keep I going. don't have the social skills. It's okay. Um, yes, this has been uh, our episode for this week. Um, thank you for tuning in, listening to us on all of the good podcasting uh, or pod catches, um, Spotify, Audible, uh, Apple Podcasts, Banana Podcasts, all the places. And you can uh, obviously find us on all of the good procrastination apps, Facebook, Twitter, or the artist formerly known as Twitter, um, Instagram, yeah. Blue sky for all you Ooh, for all you Mastodon. Hi. Yes. On the old TikTok. What are your handles, Kavi? We didn't even do those yet. Ah yes. My handles are all fun fact science. You can find me at, at fun fact science in all of these good places and also the bad places. What about you, Benjamin? Uh you can find me under the name Actually Science on Facebook. And then you can find me under the names Science Actually everywhere else i have no idea how that came to pass but it has come to pass and now i'm dealing with it science actually find me everywhere look for the cute little logo or a picture of a tardigrade that's me great thank you we will see you all in the next episode good night or day <laughs> what you say that over there good day see good night good night <laughs>